Let me say this, you know, we've been in a sermon series entitled Relationships 101, and we really, uh, I really wanted to spend some time talking about singleness uh, before we transitioned into being married. And we spent some time talking about what it means to be mature as a single person. We spent some time talking about how to maximize the time that you are single. And you'll see why we spent two weeks talking about that as we kind of transition into, into marriage. And so, how many know that when you get married, you need to be mature? Come on. Right. And when you get married, how many know you need to have already maximized whatever it is God has called you to do? You need to be on, on the road to whatever God has called you to do. Come on. And one of the things that we wanted to talk about this morning, I'm just going to say some things and then I'll, I'll let... Tarsha jump in, is after years of counseling people, sometimes we still don't know if people know exactly what marriage is. Mm -hmm. And the mission that comes along with being married. Everybody has hearts in their eyes and they love one another. And, and when we counsel people, we ask them without saying I love him or her, why do you want to marry them? Mm -hmm because, oh, I love them. No, 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 let's, let's move past that because there's gonna be a day that you're not gonna really... <laughs> Come on. Oh, y'all don't wanna say amen to that. And so there will be a day when, when things are different than your wedding day. Come on. You know, because, and some of us have this, this portrait in our mind of what our wedding day is going to be, and I'm not so sure if people don't care more about the portrait than the person that they're marrying because the person that you're marrying may only look like that portrait in your mind for one day, Come on. right? Because we're in their tuxedo, she's in her white dress and everybody's looking good and your family's there, but that may only be one day, mm -hmm. amen. So when you think about marriage, what do you think about? Mm -hmm. Remember this, I said, everything starts with God. Your singleness starts with God. Your marriage relationship starts with God. Everything that you do starts with God. And know this, he is the creator of everything. Yes. And since he's the creator of everything, why wouldn't everything start with him? I wanted to lay the foundation a couple of weeks ago that everything starts with God. Your singleness is going to start with God. Your marriage relationship is going to start with God. And when you get involved in marriage, your marriage is to glorify God. Yes. When we got married, and we've been married over 30 years now, yes. our marriage relationship is to glorify God in the earth. Is this Amen. making sense? Yes. And so God's design for marriage was to glorify him and then also resemble the relationship that God has with mankind. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, we'll read one verse of Scripture. I'll make some comments on i got a quick illustration that I want to show you. Genesis chapter 1. Now, Genesis is the first book in the Bible. So if you've already started spinning pages, you've gone too far. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, uno, uno, Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says this, verse 26, it says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So, so God, you can hold that, make 
picture. It doesn't time out on me. God, when we read Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, God said, let us make. God, actually, when you read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it comes from the word Elohim. E-L-O-H-I-M. El meaning God. Him being, whenever you see him, usually it's more than one person. And this is what you have to understand. Elohim means the creator mm -hmm. of everything. It also means, it's, it's a plural word even though we use it singularly. We use Elohim singularly in the same way that we use the word team or the word army singularly. We're talking about a group of people, what we refer to them as an army or we refer to them as a team. So, and notice this, the Bible's so clear. The Bible says, and God said, let us Come on. make man in our likeness and in our image. So we have the same spirit of God, and then we have been made to resemble God. Amen. How many know our God is a three-part being? Yes. So we serve what's known as a triune God, mm -hmm. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're three, but yet they're one. Mm -hmm. This is making sense. So, so we have Father who is is by himself who he is. We have the Son who by himself is who he is. And we have the Holy Spirit by himself who he is. They're three, but yet they're one. Mm -hmm. Is this making sense? When you get married, you are now two becoming one. And so this is the beauty of what God did as the creator. So he says, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we're one. And I'm getting ready to make a man who is spirit, soul, and body. Amen. So they're three in one. When he created you, you're three in one. Mm -hmm. Is this making sense? Come up, come up, guys, just half a second. And so let me, and let me show you how this pertains to marriage, because if everything starts with God, then we have to have God in everything we do, including our marriage. Is this making sense? Come up here, uh, just the three of you. So, so, so what we have here make room for y'all trying to not make room for him <laughs> so so what we have here is father son holy spirit they're three but they're one is this making sense so 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 now when you get married the bible says that two shall become one and so now turn around and face me and, and hope so so if i get together with my partner for life we're not complete because we don't resemble God. Wow. God says that I'm creating you in my image and in my likeness. So how many people see three over there and two over here? Mm -hmm. so, so, so fan out and face us the way we're. Get in the middle, Mel. Somebody get in the middle. So, so what's missing over here, come over here, Travis. Stand next to me. Is that, well, stand in the middle. You're going to have to have God in the center of your relationship. Yes. And so as a Christian, if we are to resemble God, mm -hmm. then we also have to have God in the middle of what we're doing. Is that making sense? So, so Elohim is the creator. He's the sustainer of all that goes on. And now that two become one, the only way two are going to be ever... To, the only way the two are ever going to become one is that if you have somebody Come that's on. holding both of y'all together. Can all the married people say amen, amen. in the house? Amen. You're going to have to have somebody on the middle of your relationship, in the middle of your relationship, that when I don't act right, he can whisper in her ear to say, he's still Thank all right. You, and then when she doesn't act right, he can whisper in my ear and say, like, it's still going to be okay. Because after all, both of y'all are Christians. Sometimes you aren't as mature as you need to be. Sometimes you haven't maximized your, your maturity. You haven't maximized your finances. You haven't maximized your emotions. You haven't maximized your attitude, but it's still going to be okay because I'm going to work with them. Amen. Amen. It's just making sense. Yeah. So, so we have been created in his image and in his likeness. Thank you. That's that. so, so I wanted to start off by, by at least saying that just to make sure that we're all on the same page because Paul tells husbands to love unconditionally. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. 
Ephesians chapter 5. When you have it, say amen. Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says this, verse 25. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Amen. So a husband is to love his wife even as, or just like Jesus, loved his bride, which is known as the church. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. Mm -hmm. Jesus has laid down his life for his bride. You'll get that when you get home. So, so a husband is to love his wife even as Jesus loved his bride, the church. And we know this, that the overarching message in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, is love. Mm -hmm. Husbands love. Amen. Say husbands. Husbands. Love. Love. And, and this is the thing. There, there are, well, there, there are four that we use primarily, but I think there are about eight Greek words when you read Scripture that, that come up with the, with the word love, mm -hmm. right? And, and one of them is called eros, E-R-O-S, which is where we get the word erotic from. We all, some of us know about that, that mm -hmm. word love. <laughs> the, the other one is called storge, S-T-O-R-G-E. And so storge is the love that we have toward our family toward our mother, our father, our cousins, our uncle, that family love. The other one is called phileo, which is the love that we have toward other brothers and other sisters. If you go to a place in Pennsylvania, you'll go to a place called Philadelphia, and it's pl the place of brotherly love. But then there's also another word in Scripture. It's called agape, and agape is loving unconditionally. Yes. This is what you need to know before you say, I do. Come on. That, that I'm going to love you unconditionally. And I'm mature enough to do that. Right. Not when, when I'm tired of sex and sex plays out that I'm getting ready to leave. And not when you make a mistake and I'm getting ready to leave. And not because things didn't go the way I thought they were going to go, I'm getting ready to leave. And by the way, you should have found out enough about him or her before you married them to know how what your pathway was going was to look like. Y'all don't want to say amen but, amen, but but that's okay. And so say agape. Agape. So agape is the level of love that God wants everyone to have before you get married. Mm -hmm. And if you can't love like that, then you might need to take a little while before you say, I do. Mm -hmm. Because marriage comes with a mission. Yes. And you are going to resemble, your marriage on earth will resemble Jesus' marriage with his bride. Mm -hmm. Is this making sense? And one of the things I like about Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, it says, husband loves your wife as Christ loved the church. And then it says, he gave himself for it. Amen. Anything that the church needed, the bridegroom provided. Yeah, I got a couple of amens on that. Whatever the church, the bride was lacking, Jesus, the bridegroom, provided. Is this making sense? So, so not only, so this is what I like about scripture. So Paul just didn't say love. He said love and this is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. He said, and he gave himself for his bride. So Jesus gives us strength and inner power and joy and rest and peace and sanctity. And he's redeemed us from the enemy. He has given his bride, the church, power. Is this making sense? And so think about this. Everything that we needed and we were incapable of a getting on our own, he provided it for us. Amen. You take that picture into your marriage. I'm here with someone that they aren't able to do what they want to do, so let me help them get to that next point in life. Is this Amen. making sense? The amens are kind of getting weaker, but, but that's okay. Because the mission of marriage is to help fulfill the purpose that God gave to mankind. And remember, our purpose was to be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue the earth. 
In some cases, depending on what God has, your, has planned for you, you may not be able to do that by yourself. And when you reach a point in life where God knows that you need help, he'll send you help. Amen. If you're single, say this. Say, my Adam is coming. If you're single, say, my Eve is coming. The men wasn't wanting to say that, but, but, that, but, that, but that's okay. And so the Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. I'm going to read this. I'm going to turn it over to you. It says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. For this cause shall you leave your mother and your father, and you shall be joined to one flesh. So joined actually comes from the word which means to be glued together. Hmm. You're glued to your spouse, not your mama and them. Come on. <laughs> not your daddy them. And, and this is the thing about marriage, and this is why it's, it's so important, and because God ordained marriage for one man, one woman, for one lifetime. That's marriage. That, that was his original intent for marriage. Is this making sense? And so he says that when you're glued together, he says, let no man divide you because once you glue something, it should stay together. Yes. So, so he said, bye mama, bye daddy. My spouse is now the first person in my life. Yeah. Amen, Pastor Randy, you're preaching good. I know, I know it, I know it. And so, and so are you saying that I, I, I forsake my mother and I forsake my dad? No, no, no. I'm not saying that you forsake them totally. I'm just saying that when you get married, they become number one. What's important to her now becomes more important than what was important to my mama, what was important to my daddy, what was important to my grandma, what was important to my grandfather, because she's number one. This is making sense. So if you can't get along with her, and so let me back up. So the person that you brought home, you should have been, you should have made sure they can get along with. Come on. <laughs> is this making sense? Jesus has come to make us better. Amen. One of the things that we see from day to day that's missing in the union of two people becoming one is commitment. Mm -hmm. Say commitment. Commitment. Say commitment. Commitment. And when you get married, it's all about commitment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because there will be days that you are loving and in love, and then there will be days... Mama said there'll be days like this. There will be days like this. Mama said. You have something about commitment? <laughs> yes. Um, I want to back up to what you were talking about first, about maturity. You know, Pastor Randy had talked about being mature in your singleness. Yes. You have to take that same maturity into um, being married. Yes. And the thing about maturity, it comes with responsibility. Somebody say responsibility. Yes, So Lord. two questions that God asked um, in Eden. He asked, Adam, where are, are you? you? So men, you have to be responsible to know where you are. Yes, yes. And then yes. he also asked Eve, what have you done? Yes. You have to be responsible to take um, accountability for what you have done. And so when I think about um, being responsible, it means that we're dependable. Pastor Randy, yeah. that means yeah. I can rely on you because you're yes. dependable. Yes. It means that I'm going to keep my promise. It means that I'm trustworthy. Mm -hmm. It means that I'm going to honor our commitment. And let's talk about commitment. What, what really does commitment mean? Because that's a hard word, not just um, in marriage. It's a hard word for us to deal with in life. Yeah. But being committed, it means that I'm going to see this thing out into the end. You think about an athlete that's committed to their goal, no matter what comes up, 
they're going to be committed to seeing it to the end. It means that I give my time and I'm giving my energy to it. It means yeah. that the decisions that I make going forward, I'm going to hang in there when times get tough. And that's the hard part about commitment because it's easy, like Pastor Randy mm -hmm. said, on the honeymoon. But after the honeymoon, when you get home, and I don't know about y'all, but I remember after the honeymoon, woo, when you get back home and you trying to figure out how to live yes, with this Lord. person that yes. you just, you find out a whole bunch more about them. So it's, it's, it's good to do your work <laughs> up front. Um, but it's, um, it's a thing that, you know, it's a mentality that not everybody has, talking about commitment, because it's easy for people to say, girl, you're not happy anymore. You need to find your own joy. What about you? What about how you feel? Mm -hmm. What about um, yourself? You deserve happiness. And yes. guys, on yes. the same, same aspect, men will tell you, like, man, I wouldn't take all of that. It don't take mm -hmm. all of that. She's too much or... All of these things, but to be committed is going the distance. And so when somebody is deeply committed to something, um, they stand out from the crowd. You know, sometimes you hear people say, oh, we've been married for 50 or 60 years, and people are like, what? Y'all been married that long? Yes. That's somebody that's standing out from the crowd. Yes. Um, when you see a person who is successful, I will tell you that every person that's truly successful, they had to get commitment down. They had to be, um, have a sense of yes, purpose. They yes. had to have life that no matter what's going on, something in their life that's happening is they had to have that deep commitment. And so committed people, they have priorities and they know where their priorities lie and they stick to those priorities. They develop routines that help them to um, be steady in their priorities. Yep. You know, we had a great sermon series, 1440, um, at the beginning of this year. And so when you're committed, I that. mean, <laughs> it's a routine that you have yes. to keep up with. Um, you're setting goals. They're loyal to themselves. If I'm committed to something, I'm going to be loyal, first of all, to myself. Yes. And when you find loyalty to yourself, and you can find that you can be loyalty, loyal to yourself, then you're finding that you can be committed to other people because you are um, determined. Let, let me say this, because I like the example that you, you used about uh, an athlete. I mean, because I think sometimes what we don't understand about the level of commitment if you talk about, especially a, uh, an athlete or someone who wants to go to the Olympics or someone who wants to finish their education, someone who wants to go to school, so not only are they committed to do what God has put in their heart to do, that's their level of commitment. But if you're married to that person, you also have to have a level of commitment to be with them even though they say, hey, I don't eat that anymore, I can't eat that anymore, I got to get up at 5 o'clock to go train now, I got to get up at 4 o'clock to do this, I have to go to bed by 8 o'clock now, and you're married to that person, you're going to have to be just as committed as they are. Is everyone getting this? And so there are times with, uh, with pastoring and, and, and church, to be committed sometimes takes away from some of the things we would like to do. Mm -hmm. But she has to be just as committed as I am, right? So, so let's go to the movies on Saturday night at 7. I can't do it Saturday night at 7 because I'm working on what we're going to talk about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So she has to be committed to that. Yeah. Well, let's do this on Sunday afternoon. Come on, boo. You already know. You already know where. where. So, so that's a level of commitment. So not only is... The spouse committed, but the person who's married to the spouse has to be committed. Mm -hmm. Can I be honest with you as your, as your pastor? As a pastor, because there are visitors here. I've seen people who are not committed to church. I've seen people who are not committed to themselves. Right? Because you said you're going to eat better. You said you're going to have a meal plan. You said you're going to diet. You said you're going to lose 10 pounds by the end of the year. And, and you haven't even been committed to you. 
Come on. And now you're getting ready to make one of the biggest decisions of your life that hinges on you being committed and that person being committed, and you hadn't even been committed to you. You start this new plan January 1st, and by January 31st, you have ho-hos, you, you got Twinkies, you got, and, and, and now think about, because this is the seriousness of it, because God said one man, one woman, one lifetime, it's supposed to be a permanent thing. He said, I'm going to glue two people together and they should not be asunder. Come on. And now you're getting ready to enter into this, this relationship. No wonder the preacher says, don't enter into this lightly. You got to have your eyes open. Is this making sense? And so say commitment. Commitment. So, so, and sometimes we just rush right through, right? So, so now we get to a day where you know, we have two to 500 of our closest friends, hmm. our family's there, the, the, the photographer's there, I'm looking good, she's looking good, and we recite these vows about commitment, but sometimes we don't keep our commitment. This is making sense. And, and for some of you, you've already been through that once. That day, you've already been through it once, and you have seen firsthand the level of commitment that it takes mm -hmm. to sustain a marriage. Marriage is hard work, but marriage isn't hard all the time. Come on. So if you're talking to someone, they're like, ooh, boy. You know, one year, the next year, the fourth year, they're like, ooh, marriage is hard. The eighth year, oh, marriage is hard. Then, then you might have <laughs> not made the right decision. Is this making sense? <laughs> Think about this statement when you get married. I'm committed to helping you reach your goals, find peace, find joy, pursue your education if that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Pursue prosperity if that's what you want to do. Because sometimes to pursue prosperity is going to cost you a lot of time. Come on. So I remember when Tarsha was, was, was working, uh, there would be times that she would leave our house at 5.30, 5.45 in the morning, and I would not see her until 8, 9 o'clock at night. And if it was a Wednesday, she would leave that morning, and I wouldn't see her until Bible study. Mm -hmm. So she worked downtown, so she said there's no sense in me driving back home and then go back to the church, because our church was on the south side of Oklahoma City at that time. She's like, I'll just see you at, at church. And she would do that, I mean, at the end of the year, when you got to do certain things for budget and accounting and all that, I, I wouldn't see her. I would see the paychecks. <laughs> but how many know you have to be committed to that? Mm -hmm. Are you really committed? Mm -hmm. Are you really committed? That's the question. Not just are you committed to another person, are you committed to yourself? Come on. To actually do the things that you said you wanted to do just to improve you. It got quiet in here, I know. What will it take for you to take that step to actually walk into an area of true commitment? Not just saying, I love you, you love me, let's, let's, let's do this thing, you know, because people get married for a lot of reasons. Yeah. People get married because they're pregnant. People get married because they are able to change status. Like, oh, yeah, he comes from a good family. He comes from a wealthy family. He, I'm going to marry him. So some people get married to move out of their mama's house. <laughs> Y'all want to talk to me. So, so, some, some, some people get married due to finances and benefits, like, oh, yeah, he's been in the service for 20 years. Oh, I'm, I'm marrying him. She's been in the service for 20 years. I'm marrying him. I get to go on base and buy stuff tax-free. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people get married for a lot of reasons, and I don't know if at the bottom of everything, if love is there. Come on. And you're like, well, Pastor Randy, I'm engaged. I'm not trying to dissuade you from getting married, you know, although some people get married so they can have sex legally because you grew up in church all your life and they're like, you know, you shouldn't be in fornication. 
So, so that means Paul said it's better to have a wife than to burn. So, so girl, let's go ahead and get married. Well, if you don't really know her, you don't really know him, then I would advise not to get married. Mm-hmm. This, this was unthought of pastoral counseling. Just because you are pregnant may not be the reason why you need to get married. And as a pastor, I don't mind. Do you know anything about him? Do you know anything about her? Do you know anything about family? Do you know anything about this, that, and the other? And if you don't, I don't know. There's still some things you need to talk about for the next nine months before this baby comes. Before you say, I do. Because there's no sense in jumping the broom. And then in six months later, you jump back over the broom. Is this making sense? Meaning it's no sense in getting married today and then get divorced tomorrow. Do you have anything on that? Yeah. I did want to talk a little bit more um, about commitment because a lot of times when we think about commitment, it's like, girl, he's committed to me. He's not cheating. He's staying in the house. Or um, guys will say, yeah, I know she's committed because one thing I wanted to point out is that it goes much further than cheating. Like, that's just the surface level, but what does commitment look like in marriage? It means keeping the covenant of marriage. Yes. You know, you talked a lot about the wedding day and the pictures and the things that you have at marriage. I started thinking when we were talking about this lesson is like, what does the preacher say? How many times do we go back and remember what the preacher said mm. when we were getting married, that marriage covenant? He's he, first thing that he says that marriage, it shouldn't be entered into lightly. That means you have to put some work into it. You have to put some thought yeah. into it. Um, he says that what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Amen. Including you. Yes. Um, there's words about leaving and cleaving, and we mm-hmm. can talk about that. And then at the end, it's for a lifetime till death do us part. A lifetime. And when I think about a lifetime of being committed to someone in a marriage, I think about the different times that I've lived with other people, right? So in your parents' house, you're there 18 to 24 years. Maybe you go to college, you have a roommate, you know, for about three or four years, or actually, if you're like me, you got to change that roommate after the first semester. <laughs> Didn't work out like that because living with somebody is hard, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and then maybe you live with somebody before you're married and that didn't work out. But your longest relationship of being in the house every day with somebody yeah. is your marriage you're relationship. Right. So if you get married when you're 30 and you're 80 now, you've been living with somebody for 50 years, right? And so if you want this thing to work, the wisdom comes um, before you make that commitment. Mm -hmm. But then once you're in it, you have to continue to be committed, be, be committed to making yourself better and then also being committed to Um, doing whatever it takes to make your spouse better as well. Yes. And I think you were going to say some things about um, the marriage covenant. Yeah, but but before I do, I I just want to just echo some of the things that you were, I mean, you were saying living with somebody is is something else. Mm. (laughs) Right? So when you you see um, uh, the real them, you know, their habits, their, their tendencies. Um, and one of the reasons we wanted to take some time just to kind of talk, because we're in the middle of this sermon series, Relationship 101. But, I mean, when we got married, Tarsha was 22. So do I have anybody here who's 22 or younger? Raise your hand. <laughs> A couple of people. I, I would not advise <laughs> getting married at 22. Yeah. I was 25, still living at home. She said, you know, 18 to 24. I was still there. I was, t- I was 25, right? So I had a good thing with my parents' house. Does this make sense? I treated my daddy like the daddy. He treated me like a son. I was able to come and go as I pleased. Wasn't paying rent. I'm like, the Lord, is- this is the next thing to heaven. But the thing is, because of that, 
I was very immature. Mm -hmm. But what I did not know is that she was insecure yeah. about some things. Mm -hmm. and, and when her insecurity met my immaturity, it was, it was insanity. It was. I mean, you're like insanity. Insanity has been defined as doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. So when she talked about the first several years of our marriage, we were doing the same thing. We were going to church. Yes. So going to church does not exempt you from having to work through things in your marriage. Amen. It's like, well, I'm saved. Well, everybody's saved. But the divorce rate is still 40 to 50%, and that includes Christians. Yes. And every time you get remarried, the divorce rate for you goes up. It yes. doesn't go down. What it means is that people aren't even learning that I've gone into a marriage, I got divorced, I'm remarried, and you didn't take anything from the first marriage, or maybe now it's easier to say. Right. So the first time I put up with all of that for 12 years, now <laughs> it's my fourth year, and I'm like, oh, no, I can see where this is going. It doesn't mean that you got into it with another level of commitment, that you went into it with your eyes a little bit more open, that you went into it using unconditional love instead of erotic love. Come on. Because sex will change as you get older. Is this making sense? As you get older, it's going to change. So that's why you're like, Pastor Randy, why are you going to the gym? I'm going to the gym because I'm trying to keep it. I'm, I'm trying to. Keep it. Keep, keep it, it. Keep, keep it. it. She Whatever said, you got to do to keep it. <laughs> She's like, yeah, we all, we going to the gym. Yes. So, but let me say this. I'm going to talk a little bit about vows. Okay. Or do you have something? Go ahead. So think about this. The wedding vows on a wedding day are spoken by each other to each other. And it's a statement of your commitment. And our partners in covenant meeting, even at the beginning of our meeting or at the end of our meeting, we make sure that we recite our vows. Mm -hmm. And engaged couples, they're like, ooh, I don't know, maybe it's superstitious. I don't want to recite my vows until the wedding day. And, and I understand all of that. But at some point in time, you're going to have to recite them. Mm -hmm. And I hope you mean them when you recite them. And it's better to know before <laughs> Beforehand. you go into that Absolutely. Covenant. Yes. Your vows are actually you saying, this is what I plan to give to the marriage. Your wedding vows are a promise to yourself and to each other that you're going to work every day to live out your marriage vow, no matter how challenging it may be, because of your love and your commitment. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a, had a high school classmate, beautiful girl, got married, and when she got sick, she ended up getting divorced. Her husband, they got a divorce. And I'm thinking, where's that level of commitment? Right. And I don't know what goes on behind curtains and what goes on in every story, but I'm saying, like, when you make those vows, you ought to have the commitment to go with that. Amen. Is this making sense? When you get married, you are automatically putting that other person before you. You think about their needs in the same way you think about your needs. You think about their desires and their wants in the same way you think about your desires and your wants because you're not single anymore. Now you're married. Amen. Amen. In fact, when you recite those vows, those vows become the boundaries to your marriage. So, so if you ever wanted to know what the boundaries of your Christian life should look like, you should go to the Bible because it'll give you the boundaries of where you should be and where you shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. The marriage vows give you the boundaries on where you should be and where you shouldn't be. Amen. Amen. And so I know some people who choose to write their own vows, and I'm getting ready to mess with you in a minute, right? So, and, and, and those vows sound good, 
You may say, hey, I stand here today with tears in my eyes, and when I think about you, I'm just, I just reflect on that you are the sun to my day, and you're the moon to my night, and when I wake up, I just see stars, and they have your name on them, and I'm just enamored with your love, and I just like your body is just everything that I would want it to be, and, but if I'm marrying you, I want to hear some vows. Come on. <laughs> Y'all want to talk to me. I, I, I want to hear some what you going to do if this happened, what you going to do if that happened. It's, it's good. You can, you can tell her all of that. You can tell him all that at the honeymoon. But, but what, about, what about things that, that sound like I will have and hold you for the rest of your life? Come on. Is this making sense? So, so stand up half, half, half a second. So, so what you're saying is, I want you. I don't want anybody else. Because at the end of the vow, they're going to say, forsaking all others. Mm -hmm. Will you have her? So, so, so this means I got you. I have you, and I'm holding you till death do we us part. Mm -hmm. Whether we have a good day today, Come on. I still got you. Whether you're mad at me today, I still got you. Whether I'm mad at you today, I still got you. Whether we go down the hallway today and don't say anything to each other that day, I have and hold you, I got you. Yes. Whether we have money or not as much money, I, I, still, I still got you. Yes. Either, even when I get in the car and the car's still on E, even after we've had this conversation about if you're in the car and it gets below half a tank, just go ahead and fill it up. But, but I, I still, you, I still you. got you. Thank I still you. got you. Thank you. <laughs> because that's unconditional love. Yes. That in your 40s, you decide, I think I want to start a business. I still, <laughs> I still got you. Is this making sense? Yeah. That no matter what comes up or what goes down, I got you. Mm -hmm. In sickness and in health, for richer or for poor, I got you. That's what you're saying. That no matter what happens, I got you. Because by the mere fact that I said I'm going to have and hold you until death do us part, I have you. Yeah. When, when you don't even know sometimes what's going on with you and, and, and what you're going through, I, I don't know what's going on with you. You don't know what's going on with you, but I'm still, I, I'm still here. Yeah. Whenever you want to talk, I'm here. Whenever you want to address the situation, I'm here. Is this making sense? Because how many know that sometimes as you live life, you may feel certain ways and you may not know why you feel this just ain't, this ain't, I just don't know why I feel this way. Right. And you need someone who's going to be committed enough to say, I'm going to give you your space. And whenever you want to talk, I'm here because we're in this together. Amen. Say together. Together. The Bible says, how can two walk together unless they be in agreement? That means I got you. Mm -hmm. Through the in-laws and the outlaws, I got you. Yeah. Through kids, young and, and older, I still got you. Yeah. Because you may be raising kids today, but you're raising them to one day leave your house. Yes, Lord. That, I mean, that's, that's the purpose, that you put in them everything that it's going to take for them to be a successful member of society, and you put Christ in them, and you pray that they live out their Christian, Christianity, but other than that, they're gone, and you know what? We're going to be right back to where, where we started. And, and, and sometimes it's good, like when the kids get on out, when you're older, you're like, well, the kids ain't here today. Oh, I better, I'm going to leave that alone. You know, when you were talking about how you have me, I know that that was one of the things that I needed in my marriage at the time. Yeah. Um, because like Pastor Randy said, when we first got married, I was young, so give it to me. I'm just young. I was uh. very <laughs> insecure. I was. And I think a lot of, you know, you don't know what you know until later things are revealed. But I thank God for his patience with me because, I mean... I'd be like, where you been? And this is before. This is like, this is the 90s. Let's go back to the 90s, mm. right? So we didn't have no cell phones. I couldn't call you. 
Um, but you had a beeper, right? A work pager. <laughs> he had a pager for work. And, and I was, I was like, it was a legitimate pager, <laughs> legitimate work. Legitimate I'm like, work. you've been gone for like four or five hours. Where are you? Mm-hmm. Like, I was hooping. I was just playing basketball. I'm like, you didn't look at your pager? He's like, you expect for me to stop playing basketball, Mm -hmm. look at my pager, go to a pay phone, call you and say, (laughs) hey, by the way, I'm just hooping with the boys or whatever. But I I thank God that that, um, commitment is Mm -hmm. not conditional. And I thank God that you saw me through that part and I know that there's a lot of things that I was also seeing you through mm-hmm. in your immaturity because we were young. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, even though we were in church and we were going to church, again, this is back in the 90s, we wasn't that a whole bunch of premarital counseling, or at least there was no not, where we, counseling. not where we came from. It was mm-hmm. like, okay, y'all both saved. Y'all believe this. You believe the same thing. Okay, well, you're getting married, and this is a commitment that you made. But there was a lot of things that we found out rude awakening, just being married together. And let me say this, I mean, because when we got married, there wasn't this big, you know, philosophy of premarital counseling the way you may hear it today. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a lot of, if you're having issues, you may want to seek counseling. But I grew up in a time where the church was still fighting against mental health practitioners. They were saying God is the counselor. And I'm like, okay, and, and, and so thank God that we worked it out. But I'm saying there are so many different ways to handle things in your marriage now that we didn't, we didn't even have right. back then. Right. And so the root cause of my being insecure, I didn't find out until later, years later. But what would have happened if you wouldn't have had that commitment to mm-hmm. me and to the marriage um, when I was cuckoo crazy? Yeah. I was crazy. I was crazy. She was. Yeah. But that's why just I love bit, what God has done much. for me now. Much. I am so free. <laughs> Jealousy, all that other stuff don't live in me no more. I am changed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God for change. Thank him. I'm going to say this. I'll, let me say something okay, first. Go ahead, go let ahead, me get finished with my... I want to I wanna tell this story, but go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. One of, and I'll tell you this, too, uh, about being commitment. One of my biggest struggles, even today, we all have our different things that we struggle with. Mine's are not much. Were y'all here last week and Pastor Randy told all that good stuff about me? I was going to have them play it back on the clip, but I, I'll, I'll let y'all listen to it on the video. What he didn't tell is, you know, about the insecurities. But then one of my biggest struggles in our marriage um, has been with my weight. Ladies, can y'all identify, anybody identify with me? It ain't just the ladies, but don't leave me out here by myself. But it's been with my weight. Um, You know, when Randy and I first got married, um, I was, imagine this. I was about 145 to 155 when we got married. 140, but anyway, that's... (laughs) Well, I haven't seen that weight since Y2K, and some of y'all are too young. (laughs) to know what Y2K is, but um, don't judge me, don't judge me. I have been trying, and it's been an up and it's been a down, and it has been the biggest battle of my life, right? So thank God it's just weight, you know, but I do everything that I can. I am, let me take that back, I am learning to be disciplined, more disciplined Mm -hmm. to do what I can. I've always worked out, always been at the gym, but it's my eating habits, right? It don't go, you don't go together. And so you can't just kind of mm-hmm. work off what you eat. It don't work like that. You know, put in ho-hos and pastries and stuff and then work it out on the treadmill. Don't go like that. Mm-hmm. But I am committed. I am committed. I am going to change. But because I don't look like that picture on my wedding day, and let me tell y'all this real funny story. I remember there was this lady in the church. She had came into Pastor Randy's office at one point, for some reason, and she was my friend, but she hurt my feelings so bad because <laughs> she came in Pastor Randy's office and he had a picture of our wedding day there. She's like, oh, is that you? <laughs> Girl, is that you? I was like, man, that's my friend. Yep. But I'm so glad that um, 
I, you know, even though I don't look like what my wedding picture looks like <laughs> in that day, Who's that does? you didn't decommit, you know, mm -hmm. because a lot of times people will decommit because it's conditional. Like, mm -hmm. that picture of whoever you marry at whatever time, and I'm just talking about the physical, like, appearance stuff, but what if your spouse gets sick? Like mm -hmm. you said, mm -hmm. you had a friend that decommitted because his wife got sick and he didn't sign up for that. But really, are you going to go through this? And the reason why um, I stress now premarital counseling before people get married and make that commitment, and maybe you're like me, and you just kind of work through some things with God's grace, but think about all of those things before you really make that commitment. It's because what they look like today, their health, um, their wellness, all of that stuff may not be like that 10, 20 years from now. So it's important that you um, yes. understand what that's looking like. Mm -hmm. Amen. Go ahead and say your story now. Okay. Well, we had gotten, just talking about some of the insecurities. This is so funny, but... Um, I remember that we had gotten married, and you may, you may remember this, that she was at work, and I, you know, it was either Christmas or Valentine's Day. I got those red uh, rose petals, mm -hmm. and I put them all through the house when she comes home. You know, I mean, it was a lot of red petals, you know, like coming to America, like red, red petals. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, and I had went and bought like this red comforter, and, and I went so far as to take, I took all the white lights out and I put like red lights in. So when she turned, it was just going to be padow, right? And I remember she came home and, you know, she saw the rose and everything. She went in the bedroom. She turned the red lights on and she got <laughs> so mad. I'm like, what is wrong? She's like, my mama told me about the ladies on the red light district. Do you think I'm a red light? I'm like, I don't even know. What, what are you talking about? I'm like... What is a red light ditcher? I'm not a red light ditcher. I'm like, I'm just trying to be romantic. I'll, let me put the, light, the white light bulb back in. I don't, I don't, what have I done? Yeah, that is, that is so thought, much of a true oh story. Oh my God. Again, I came with baggage he didn't know about. So, so, I'm like, I need to talk to your mama. <laughs> yes. So let me leave you with this, Ephesians chapter 5, and in my closet, I still have that uh, red bulb. It always reminds me, when I go in my closet, I always chuckle, because that, that bulb is probably... You, you can put the red bulb in now. I'm, 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 I'm good with the red bulb <laughs> okay. now. I'm, okay. I'm good with that. Okay. Well, we're getting ready to stand. I am Let's changing. Stand, we're getting ready to... No, I'm serious. We're standing. We're getting ready to stand. We're getting ready to stand. Getting ready to stand. I'm going to leave you with this one scripture. Turn out the light. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says this, verse 25, which we already read. Husband, love your wife. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Notice this. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 says this, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. All husbands have to know this, that you are there to help your spouse. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is what I like about Ephesians chapter 5, that notice this, Jesus, the, Paul is saying that this is what Jesus does to the church that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he was the priest to his wife. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the priest to the church. And anything, once again, anything that the church needs, Jesus is willing to provide. Mm -hmm. Verse 27, it says that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Notice, notice this not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing. In marriages, you will have wrinkles. You will have spots. You will have blemishes, and you will have any such thing. Mm -hmm. 
And there are some things that Jesus says they had a spot, they had a wrinkle that still didn't deter me from loving them. Mm -hmm. It just made me do some different things to get the spots out, to get the blemishes out. And so in order to get wrinkles out, it may take a little heat. In order to get spots out, it may take a little agitation in the washer. I mean, but at the end of the day, you want something that's spotless, with no blemish, no wrinkles. And know this, you could do that today, and then you could have wrinkles next month, which means there's still going to be work to be done. No one irons something one day, and it stays that way the rest of your life. It takes work every single day. Mm-hmm. Is this making sense? Husbands, there, are, there is a huge responsibility on you. Wives, there are, there's a huge responsibility for you. Because in other scripture, the Bible says that we submit ourselves to one another. Is this making sense? Amen. What we wanted to do today was to kind of lay a foundation for next week, right? Because when we start picking up with marriage again, um, there are some things that I wanted you to already know and understand about marriage. Yeah. There are a lot of people that have talked to me this year that they are engaged. And I'm happy, I'm happy for you, right? And so I think it's an admirable step, uh, and I want you to succeed. Uh, and as a pastor uh, in a great church, uh, we're going to do everything we can in our power to make sure that, that you have the best foundation yes. as you enter into, into marriage because I want your marriage to last, right? So if it's a second marriage, I want your second marriage to last. If it's a third marriage, I want your third marriage to last. If it's a fourth marriage, I want your fourth marriage to last. Yes. When you think about marriage, I want you to think about this, that God created Adam and Eve and he put them together even before there was a church. There was marriage before there was church. There was marriage before anybody was called a Christian. There was marriage before there was a Christian faith. Marriage should be something in the earth that would be able to gratify you, satisfy you. That's why I said earlier, if you're like, well, my marriage is too hard, this is hard, then, then take a step back and say, what can I contribute to make my marriage better? Yeah. What, how do you set your thermostat? Because if you set your thermostat right, that when maybe the husband comes home, there's peace in the house, or when, when the wife comes home, there's peace in the house, how many people have ever had this experience? Like your, your, your spouse is like, okay, you know, they're not in your right mind. And you're like, I'm not going to argue with them. I'm, no matter what they say, I'm not going to argue with them. But before you know it, <laughs> they said something. You said like, I'm not, because you know the word. It says a soft answer turns away, turns away wrath. wrath. And you're like, all I have to do is just be cool, be calm, and, and it's going to be okay. But then they kept pushing Sometimes it just takes one. One mature person to say, it's not going to happen today, devil. It's not going to happen today. We're going to have a peaceful day today. And when I think about unbelievers, they still have an opportunity to have a great marriage because marriage was created even before the church. Now, will your, matter, will, your, will your marriage do a lot better with Christ as the center of it? Absolutely. Yes. But think about the design that God had even for the earth to create marriage, that everyone has an opportunity at one point in time maybe to be married. It's a benefit of the earth because when you get to heaven, there is no marriage. Mm-hmm. We spend a lot of time down here wanting to get married and being married and this, that, and the other. And when you get to heaven... Jesus plainly said, there is, no, there is no marriage. If you're here this morning, you're like, you know what? I'm thinking about getting married, uh, or I'm in the middle of a marriage, and we actually need a little bit of help in our marriage. Uh, I just want to pray with you. 
Amen. Because uh, I have been where you are. Amen. Right? And so we need to be able to draw on the power of the Holy Spirit to help us no matter where we are. If you're single and you say, I want to get married, we can pray with you. Because the Bible says that a man who finds a wife finds a good thing. And if you're in the middle of a marriage, you know, because this is what I realized about marriage is that we could both come to church and smile come on. Been there. and still not be happy. Been there. there are times that we were arguing on the way to church, pulled up in the parking lot, arguing. By the time we got out, we was like, hey, what's, hey, man, what's up, Donnie? Hey, Brandon, what's going on, soul brother? And, and, and that's how you know, like, and then she's looking at me like, yeah. And you're going to get up and preach to the people? Right. I, I do remember there was one time I'm bawling, crying, coming to church. And I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something, ladies. I'm going to say this. I'll tell this story and I'll tell you something else. Um, I was bawling coming to church. I mean, like one of those boo-hoo cries, but I'm still going to serve the Lord. And I remember we pulled up and you had the audacity to say to me, mm -hmm. you're going to dry your tears. You're going to wipe, wipe your tears mm -hmm. before we go in here. And I was like, really? That's it? Just wipe my tears yeah. before we go in here. But I am so glad that you know, because we made it through the rough times, before we, because we made it through the times of, you know, the hard times, and we stayed committed during that time, that now I'm reaping the benefits. I don't cry no more. He makes me mad sometimes. Not that he's perfect. We don't have nearly the arguments. I mean, I promise you, it gets so much better, but you're gonna have to just be committed through the rough times. The other thing that we didn't get a chance to talk about, um, communication and how you do that right. One thing about marrying a godly man, a man that truly loves God first, that shows that example is, in all the times that we had these like arguments, and it was mostly about money because we were like poor as poor can be, dirt poor, like um, making just so little at the time. And, you know, you guys have heard the story, like he would get paid and I would say, well, give me the check so that I can take care of the bills. And he didn't want to give me his check. I was immature. Like, I told you I was immature. Like, Or at least go deposit it in the bank. And uh -huh. then you go to the bank and you would have those ATM withdrawals. Mm -hmm. Like, I wouldn't know that the account went down <laughs> yeah. because you went to the bank. But it was so much that we had to go through and endure, but I'm so glad that we're reaping the benefits of what we went through because those things are in the past. Yes. And even when we don't agree now, it's like we've gotten to a point to where we know how to disagree agreeably. Pastor Randy has never cursed me, never called me out of my name. I've never cursed him, never called him out of his name. We don't talk to our children that way. And I can say that because I married a godly man, a man that truly loved God, that was one of the benefits that I reaped in marrying him. And all I can say is it gets better. So. I don't know who you are. If you're struggling in your marriage, you just recently started or you've hit a rough patch and rough patches can come like when your kids leave home and you're trying to figure out who you are as a couple because yep. you've been taking care of them so much. Mm -hmm. um, it can happen when you have go through a pandemic. I mean, if you guys have survived your marriages through a pandemic, <laughs> praise God for yes. that. But anything can happen, but we just want to just take a moment to pray with you. Um, again, it doesn't even have to be a situation where it's terrible and you're thinking about getting a divorce. One of the things that we always say about um, marriage is it does require work. It requires labor. Um, the reason why we have our marriage ministry is so that people can come and be refreshed, learn how to have fun, learn how to communicate with each other. So when you do have disagreements, that you can communicate in a nice way. You don't have yeah. to curse or yell, and you can have that soft answer, and you don't have to respond to everything, but 
Again, I am so glad that I don't cry no more. <laughs> I used to be a crybaby, but thank God for that. Amen. If you're here this morning, just lift your hands, and we just want to, I want to pray with you. I want Impact Community Church to be known as a church that prays, to be known as a church where God's presence shows up, to be known as a church where people love God. And realize this, that nobody is perfect. And so what Tarsha was saying is, you know, I didn't curse and, you know, it didn't mean I didn't think it. Right. Right. But this is the thing, too, is when you overstep your bounds, I always had the heart to go and apologize. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's a good thing, too, right? Like, hey, I messed up. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Sometimes... Your spouse needs to hear that just a little bit more. Like, and when we talk about relationships one-on-one, sometimes your friends, whoever you're in relationship with, needs to hear that a little bit more. Like, I'm sorry, girl. I'm sorry, man. I I messed up. So please forgive me. So just lift your hands. Father, we thank you for those who are here today, God. We thank you for those who are looking online today, Lord. We ask that you would move in the midst of our relationships We ask that you would move in the middle of our marriages today, God. We thank you today that Jesus Christ habitates in our household today. He habitates in our marriage today, God. You said that two are better than one. A threefold cord cannot easily be broken today. We put our trust in you, God. We ask that you would give us uh, the humility, God, that if we need help, that we would seek those resources. We would seek those people who can help us today, God. We just ask today, oh God, that the counsel that we get would be wise counsel today, Lord. We thank you for having strong, thriving relationships, for having strong, thriving marriages, for having strong, thriving families today, God. And we just thank you today for all that you're doing in the lives of your people today. We trust you for everything, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Give God praise. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We really appreciate you supporting our broadcast. And if you've never had an opportunity to join us in person, if you're in the Oklahoma City area, we want to invite you to Impact Community Church. We're located at 4400 Northwest Expressway in the Cole Community Center. We have something for everybody in your family. Bring your kids, bring the entire family. I know they will love Impact. If you would like to sow into Impact Community Church, you can give on our website by mail or text to give. The information is on the screen. Thank you for your support.